And this is the Radio 2 News with Leo Enright. On the program just ended, and in many countries of the world, friends and music colleagues of Phil Linnett have been paying tribute to the Irish rock star who died this afternoon in an English hospital. He was just 36. Brush Shields, who played with him in Skid Row, says nothing is ever going to be the same again. He says it's one of the saddest things ever to happen in Irish rock. Phil Linnett died at Salisbury Hospital of pneumonia and heart failure. He'd been under intensive care since collapsing on Christmas night, and his estranged wife, Caroline, has been at his bedside with her father, Leslie Crowther. A few minutes ago, Phil's closest musical collaborator, Brian Downey, said he believed reporting of the dr star's drug problem had been exaggerated. The Thin Lizzy drummer spoke for the first time about his feelings on this sad night. I'm completely shattered. I can't, I can't really believe what's happened. Um, I was speaking to Phil um, 12 days before Christmas. He was fine before I left him. He seemed to be in great spirits, looking forward to Christmas, going back to his family. And he said to me at the end, he said, I'll see him in the new year, we'll have, have a good recording together. Perhaps he might have been considering uh, an attempt at reforming Thin Lizzy? Yes, that's true. Um, he did ask me to reform it with Scott Gorham. Uh, we were actually considering reforming around March, but uh, he wanted to do his own solo album first in January. But that will never be now. And more of Brian Downey's tribute on Radio 2 News at 11. Radio 2 um, Nationwide, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> This is the Radio 2 News with Leo Enright. Friends and colleagues of Phil Linnett have been paying tribute to the Irish rock star who died this afternoon in an English hospital. Phil died at Salisbury Hospital of pneumonia and heart failure. He'd been under intensive care there after being transferred from a clinic that specialises in drug and alcohol dependency. Tonight, Phil's closest musical collaborator, Brian Downey, said he believed reporting of the star's drug problem had been exaggerated, and he told us Linnett was hoping to reform Thin Lizzy in March. Brian played with Phil from their school day together and you can hear his tribute in full at the end of this bulletin. Six minutes to ten o'clock and this is Dave Fanning with uh, some music and words from Phil Linnett from uh, between now and uh, ten o'clock. Uh, Phil Linnett who died earlier on today and um, on the phone later on I hope to be talking to Scott Garham who was a member of St. Lizzie for about uh, ten years or thereabouts. But one of the things that Phil was involved in over the last two years or so was uh, a group called Grand Slam and uh, the drummer with Grand Slam hopefully is with us now. Robbie, are you there? Hello, Dave. I am here. There you are, Robbie. So, um, tell us, what's it like? I mean, how do you feel about all of this now today? Well, I, I mean, I obviously feel very sad. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty choked at the minute. I mean, when I heard he was in hospital and had been unconscious, I actually feared the worst. But even still, I mean, it came as an awful shock. I'm just sitting here in the kitchen. I'm actually listening. I've been listening to your show. I, I just feel terrible. Well, tell us first of all now, I mean, like, you've been involved with so many bands down through the years. Yeah. I mean, you've been there when Tim Lizzie were there in Dublin before they even went to London. Yeah. So, I mean, like, how well did you know Phil in those early days? Uh, well, I knew him very well. I mean, I was in a band called The Chosen Few back in the late 60s, and Philip was in, probably the middle 60s, in fact. And Philip was in, Sk in, the, Bla in the Black Eagles, in fact. And then I joined... Uh, Skid Row, which he was a member of, so I mean, we knew each other very well. We were part of, like, the I suppose the early rock scene in Ireland. We were competitors uh, in the beginning, and then we just happened to be in the same band. So I knew him very well, like from when I was about sixteen or seventeen. So I mean, I've known him, and I've kept in touch with him. I mean, even when he was away from here, when Lizzie were really doing well, and I'd always see him every couple of years or so. And then he, he was involved with Auto de Fe when I was playing with him. And then I did a few solo tours with them, and I did. I worked on various recordings, demos. And then when Brian left the band, which was in Ireland, he just asked me would I be inter interested in joining, which, which I, of course, was. So, well, I mean, I knew him very well. What was the feeling that Philip had around the time when you say when Brian left the band? I mean, I got the impression that Tim Lizzie broke up quite amicably compared to a lot of bands. Oh, yeah. You know, it was a very definite, this is the last tour, this is the last album. Yeah. Well, so I mean, you just want to start something new completely. Yeah, I think, you see, a lot of people have the impression that Philip broke up Lizzie. Uh, from what I learned, uh, in fact, it, it was the opposite. I think Brian was probably a bit tired touring. He didn't want to do so much travelling. And I think Scott might have wanted to go back to America or do a few other things. So Philip really didn't want to. And Philip wanted to be always involved in music. and He wanted to have his own band. He, wa he always liked pr sort of hard rock, whatever you want to call it, me melodic rock and roll. And he always wanted to do something like that. So he wanted to have a working band all the time. And uh, I think basically they were trying to persuade Brian 
uh, almost by default he was involved in the early demos and they sort of hoped that when the band actually started touring that he would actually mm. fall in but in fact he'd made his mind up and decided not to do it so what, what happened to there. Grand Slam then? well Grand Slam sort of started working and there was this it was going reasonably well for a new band but I think certain members of the band wanted to go a bit quicker and uh, there was a few rows towards the end it, like around Christmas last year in fact so it was still a possibility of something happening. Philip had actually got a reasonable record deal in the middle of this year, and there was talk of something happening, but, you know, nothing ever really did happen. I think he was, he was waiting to see how well various records had done. He'd recorded a few records, and probably depending on how well they did, like, as regards the live thing. I'm not really sure, you know, what would have happened. There was talk of something happening in, in 1986, but nothing definite. Yeah, well, when you talk about Phil in it, and you talk about hard rock, and the cliches that go with so many stories of hard rock down through the years, yeah. do you think that, like, and I think that Phil would probably be the first to admit this, that he, he, he led the rock and roll lifestyle a bit too hard? I, I would agree with that. He was inclined to live life to the very fullest. Sometimes I think he didn't want to, but... He was in such a position, and on, like he was never off the stage really. I mean, you couldn't walk down the street in the north of Scotland with Philip, like expecting a little quiet walk, because he'd always be recognised. He'd always be asked if he wanted to drink or whatever. And he, he like he, no matter where he was, he, like, even so much that he, even when he was at home, he had to get his phone number changed every three months because people would find out and they'd ring him up. And he was never, he was never let actually off the stage ever. I thought. I think he would like to maybe prefer to go away somewhere if maybe for a few months and get away from it all but it was a very difficult thing for him to do you know mm. and he also like he didn't he liked to be near his kids and his family and he didn't really like going away for that reason like when he was off the road he liked to be in touch with his kids and you know like any normal father he wanted to be close to his family well if he made no uh, sort of uh, pretense or anything about that sort of hard lifestyle he obviously I mean never made any pretense either about uh, the family life as well no, I mean, I mean, he was always talking about the kids he had songs and everything else and oh yeah about. I mean it was a bit of a he was sort of I suppose like he might be like a Gemini person he was a bit of, a bit of everything in him he was like the the Irish romantic writer who had the wild days and at the same time he'd still love to be home in the bosom of his family you know so I mean I just find it hard to talk about it all at the minute you know he he, he, he was the hard rocker and he was also the family man so mm. Well, were you surprised to hear that around Christmas Day there, or a few days afterwards, that Phil had been so ill since Christmas Day? In other words, like, do you think that he had got a lot sort of more together within the last six months? Well, the funny thing was, I actually met someone who came home for Christmas from London, and they told me that Phil was looking really well, and he'd actually, he had quietened down a lot, and he was looking well, and he was looking extremely healthy. So, and it seemed like uh, he'd, he'd released the record uh, in the later part of this year, and he seemed to be uh, just getting ready for 1986, so I was very shocked, yeah. Well, what do you think, like, was his plan? Because, I mean, uh, Grand Slam had gone, as you say, yeah. like, in some sort of vague arguments by last Christmas. Also, the fact that uh, before that, when Grand Slam were to start, he gave me two songs on a demo tape. One of them was 19, yeah. which was the single he released recently with Paul Hardcastle That's as, right, as yeah. a producer. So do you think it would have been, like, uh, that he was really just trying to get it together as fill-in as solo artist? Well, I think, he, I mean, he always did. He always did a lot of writing by himself. He had a studio in his house. In in Richmond and he always sort of prepared a lot of material and then depending on the suitability of the material it either be sort of put aside for a solo thing or, or the possibility of a band in the future. Now I, I'd actually heard too that he had just got a, a fairly um, good record deal in the States so, and he was very keen to break the States. I mean Grand Slam was formed uh, uh, really with the idea of going to the States yeah. and I think that was always at the back of his mind. I know he did a video for 19 which incidentally was a Grand Slam song too and uh, I yeah. just heard now how true it was I'm not actually sure but I had heard that he had got some sort of a deal organised in the States and that he was going to go back out there in 86 yeah because Huey Lewis who's got very big in the last few years he's had a few, a few songs and albums and singles yeah and so Huey Lewis has actually written a song with Philip and they'd actually recorded it it was actually it was based on one of the uh, Grand Slam songs and I think Huey put new lyrics to it now I haven't heard that but I know that again I haven't really been in touch with Philip since the summer but uh there was supposed to be some collaboration with Huey Lewis. Some of it had already been done, and I think there was more to come. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, Robbie Brennan, thanks very much for talking to Not us. Not at all. On this I'm very a, sad if day. If I could say over the air, too, Please I don't know do. whether any of his family are listening, but, again, just my sympathy to any of the family who may be listening. And that goes from everybody here as well. Thanks yeah. very much, Robbie.